Hi, it's Steve Hargadon, and we are so close to the end of this conference that I can taste it, although the next two hours are going to be so much fun. We have Roger Shank here with our penultimate keynote. Roger, thank you for being here. Happy to be here. Roger's coming in by phone, so there will not be any slides. But let's just briefly thank Classflow and Blackboard Collaborate for making this event and next week's Reinventing the Classroom event both possible. Here's a map. For those of you who are in the live session, you can click on the star to the left of the map. Click on it twice, then click on the map. And feel free to put your location in the chat. Let us know where you're participating from. We have India, Thailand, North America. So whether you're participating live or you're listening to the recording, we sure appreciate that you are participating. Roger, I'm going to turn the time over to you, but let me know how I can help. Okay, well, I'm happy to take questions more or less at any time. I don't actually believe in speeches, so I'll just start talking, but if somebody has something interesting they want to say or let me know, I'll respond to it. Um, let's just start with the fact that I don't believe in speeches, <laughs> and that's the reason for that. People can't comprehend them. And I like to challenge people with asking a simple question. Tell me a lecture you learned that you remember in college. Just tell me one. I was, happened to be at Carnegie Mellon University last week and there was somebody who was objecting specifically to this idea. And I said, okay, just give me one lecture. And he said, well, I remember Herb Simon's lecture. I said, okay, tell it to me. He said, well, I just remember him talking. <laughs> right. <laughs> you don't remember the lecture. And in fact, people can't remember when somebody talks for too long. And so right. we are naturally capable of having conversations with each other. And learning is about having a conversation. We can learn from conversations. For interaction. But when one person talks like this and everybody listens, it's very hard to learn. You need, you feel the need to interrupt. And if I was talking to you on an airplane and said I give lectures in here, I'll give you one, you wouldn't put up with it. So what actually prompted me to do this thing when I was asked to, to, to do it by Steve was I heard you say, well, you know, the future of the classroom or whatever it is you just said, uh, the, the, you know, reinventing the classroom. And I am vociferously against reinventing the classroom. I invent, I'm in favor of burning the classroom, bombing the classroom, anything but having a classroom. The classroom is an idea of economics. It is not an idea of education. Nobody ever took a classroom of two-year-olds and raised their children that way. When you raise a child, you raise a child by having a conversation with him and being there when he needs you and and maybe proposing or suggesting or showing them some things and letting them work on something and when they're interested in they drive what they're interested in doing. You might hand them a toy, but they drive it, and then they come and they ask for advice and for help. And the interesting thing is that kind of education exists entirely until the age of about six when you go to school and you're now no longer allowed to learn like that, but resumes in Ph.D. programs. Every PhD program is exactly the same. We don't have classrooms for PhD programs. I mean, we might have make them attend classes for a year or two. But the key part of a, of a PhD program is the one-on-one -on -one interaction with the mentor. He sits down, is, proposes a problem, when the kid goes out and tries to work on it, he comes back with a solution, and the, uh, the mentor kicks him and says he did it wrong and argues with him and makes him do it again until three or four years of that, and he's written a PhD thesis. And to my mind, that's all education has ever been, it's all it should ever be. And then suddenly, when we got the idea that everybody had to go to school and we could no longer teach like that, remember, rich people always taught, did that. They always had a bunch of tutors for one guy. But as soon as we think everyone should go to school, we blew the model. And the model is now everybody has to do the same thing at the same time. And everyone has to pass the same tests. And everyone has to be interested in the same stuff. And the reason why that's a really big problem is that when the curriculum was designed, it was typically designed in the 1800s, in the United States in 1892, quite literally. Uh, but they were copying the European curriculums at the time, which were designed earlier. And they were all about the same stuff, you know, mathematics, history, um, foreign language. Uh, later they threw in economics, uh, and later they threw in physics. 
but the subjects were, in 1892, written down by the president of Harvard, were exactly the same subjects that were taught at Harvard in 1892. Now, Harvard teaches a lot more subjects now, but good luck with learning any of those in high school. And so my thing is that I strongly believe that high school needs to be eliminated and then replaced by something else. I don't want a bunch of teenagers roaming around the streets unsupervised. But it's not, you know, that we'll give you some things to work on and you'll find the thing that interests you. I don't want that to happen at all. I want carefully, well-constructed ideas that we'll let you choose from. So, for example, a lot of people decide to be lawyers. I used to run a class at Yale and included what should you, one of my days was what should you do in your life. Tell, we'll skip computer science for today and just tell me what you're going to do. And I can't say class wanted to be lawyers. And I would say, do you know what a lawyer does? Well, typically they had no idea. They knew it from watching television shows, but they had no idea. And so what I'd like to see is instead of kids going, working hard in high school and then working hard in college and trying to get into law school and suddenly going through law school and thinking, gee, I really don't want to be a lawyer, to let them be a, practice being a lawyer in the first year of high school. Let's create experiences which are immediately, within the first day, hey, you've been assigned to work on this case and create a fiction. Here's the case. You're, here's your role. You're working not alone, but with a bunch of other kids and with a, a present, prob probably a lawyer as your mentor. And you can do all this online now. And physically, you're in a room where there are other kids and where there's a teacher who's patting you on the back and encouraging you to actually stick to working. But what I want to have is the kids to actually try a case. And let's say they do a month of that, and they think this is the most exciting thing in the world. I want to do a second month or a third month. Or this is boring and I want to quit. Both are okay. Now I'd like to try being a construction worker. Okay, let's get you out working on a, a hypothetical construction and then maybe put you out on the, on the real job. Or I'd like to be a doctor. Well, let's not make you learn biology and chemistry and who knows how many other subjects for eight years. Let's let you immediately work in some simulated healthcare facility and then a real healthcare facility. The, 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 this is all possible to do now. It's not, there's no reason not to do it. I, mean, I once uh, went to Boeing and said, could you help me design an aerospace engineering high school curriculum? And I asked them a simple question. I said, at the end of the full year of working on aerospace engineering, if you're a high school student, what could you do? And they said, we could design a 787. So I said, okay, that's the last project. What's the first project? They know nothing. They said, how about a table? We could design a table. And then we worked from a table to a sailboat to a racing car to a light plane to a 787. No one's making you do this. I'm arguing it should be offered. One of a hundred, a thousand curricula that should be offered that are well constructed, that have mentors available. Online allows mentors anywhere to be available. In other words, all the bored retired people in Florida who used to be engineers could teach you to be an engineer. And if you want it to be, if you don't want to be, don't be that. Uh, an example I use about this all the time is that I have a, a niece who is a graduate from the University of British Columbia as an English major, and when she finished doing that, she decided to come live with us for some reason. I don't remember why. And I talked to her and got to know her. I said, what are you going to do when you stop vacationing with us? She said, well, I'm going to go back to my job as a bartender. I said, so you went to college to be an English major so you could go be a bartender? She says, well, that's not, nobody really wants to employ an English major. So my first question is, why are there English majors? How do we even allow that? Forget about the silliness of high school. The universities are pretty silly, too. Why are we allowing that? And the second thing is to find out what she really wants, which actually was very hard to find out. What do you really like, I said. Because I really like painting. I said, okay, there's not a lot of jobs for painters, but can we just say you like art in general? Yeah, I like art. So I offered her a job unpaid to learn how to do art on a computer. By the time she got good enough, I would hire her to do art on a computer because I could use people to do that. That's a story of six or seven years ago. She's been making her living as a professional computer artist for a long time now. And why aren't they teaching that in high school? Instead of saying to the kid, you're taking art class, why don't we say to the kid, here's some practical things you could do with art. We know you like art. You can work for, a, for an advertising firm. You can work as a graphic artist. You can work in computer art. And if you like that, keep doing it and get good at it. And when you graduate high school, you'll be employable immediately. Why do we have to go to, what's with the, everyone has to go to college stuff. The reason everyone has to go to college is no one's learned anything in high school. So the issue is what should they learn in high school? And my answer is absolutely anything that's possible. You know, why isn't it possible to become a, a, a computer programmer in high school? Start learning to program, and if you like it, program. I'm not proposing if you only do one thing. Why can't we do, do three things if you want? Why can't you be in charge of your own education? 
But the most important thing is the instruction has to be one on one. So when we start talking, start talking about classrooms, always what I hear is classrooms are going to be online. Why is that a good thing? They were terrible when they weren't online. Most people, I mean, I've been, I was a professor for a long time. I don't ever remember students being able to stay awake in a large classroom, even with me talking, amazingly. Uh, in, a, in a group of 10 kids, you can get them in, engaged in a conversation, an argument, and they enjoy it. But you put 50 kids in a classroom, much less 500, it's a complete waste of everyone's time and everyone knows it. And it's done because you want to have butts in seats who pay big tuitions. It's a good money maker for universities. And high school are not making money, but they use the same model for no reason. And this idea has been around since medieval times. The reason that there are people, are somebody talking at you is that when you, you, talk, you, you don't have a book. I mean, you know, what happened in the middle of the is they had one book in the city and only one guy could read it. So he read it out loud to people. You think we could, like, get beyond that? But it's really kind of astonishing to me. So I'm worried about understanding what the real issues are. And the first issue I think is clear is that people misunderstand what knowledge is. I think knowledge is stuff, stuff you, you're supposed to remember. And I had an argument with a, with a professor the other day at a university, major university who told me that he had an experiment with online education that he was using where he had, um, he was testing the kids throughout his lecture on a constant basis so that uh, there were questions all through the lecture. So they were kind of half listening to the lecture and half asking the questions. And he said he found that the kids he did that with had a better retention of information than the kids that he didn't do that with. And my argument is, why is retention of information important? Now that's like, you know, questioning why air is important. Of course, learning is all about retention of information. No, only in school. I mean, I, 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 ha I did fail to retain some information the other day. I went to the store and I forgot to buy English muffins, which I intended to buy. And, and that's kind of retention of information that's worth it. Uh, or I would, right now I'm in New York and I was traveling around and I forgot where the 57th Street stop on one of the lines was and I walked to the wrong place. So there is some value to retention of information. But, it, but when we talk about our professional lives, it's never about retention of, of retention of information. It's about abilities. It's about knowing how to do stuff. And knowing how to do stuff comes from practice, practice, practice. And anything anyone's really good at, they're good because they've done it a lot. And so what I want high school to be is practice. And I'm starting to believe that universities shouldn't exist at all, which I realize is completely radical and completely crazy. But the reason I'm beginning to believe that is that I've been building professional master's programs, one-year programs that online, work, kids work in groups with mentors. And at the end, they have done enough so that it's very clearly hireable because they, all they've been doing is deliverables, producing, producing, producing all, all throughout the year. And they can, they can show what they've produced. And I'm wondering, why do you have to go to college to get into such a program? How, college doesn't help you any. What's the purpose of it? So my sense of what this, this, the most radical notion on education you're probably going to ever hear from anybody is I'm suggesting that after we're through with elementary school, after everyone can read and write and do arithmetic, in theory if that's what happens, um, we then put them into a high school preparation program which says, here's the whole world out there for you. Pick something. You're interested in television? Fine. We'll help. You can produce a television show. You can write a television show. You can act in a television show. I don't care what you're interested in because all those things will teach the same stuff. And that stuff is communicating, reasoning, uh, understanding how to make some decisions, uh, understanding how to get along with other people, all the things that really matter. And whatever it is that you want to do, we will help you do that until you've chosen something that you know is really where you want to go. Now, obviously, later you can change your mind, and that's fine. But at least you should come out knowing what you want. What happens today is kids go to high school and they come out being very good at studying, being very good at memorizing, being very good at, at test taking, then they arrive in college and that's the only thing they're good at, and then they get stuck in these enormous lecture halls and having to choose a major, which is basically a silly idea, I, I will explain in a minute why if anyone cares, um, and suddenly they've graduated college and they're not prepared for anything. I once had um, lunch with a guy who was on the board of trustees at the University of Illinois, and me being me, I said, so how do you like being on the board of a fraudulent institution? And he said, well, what do you mean a fraudulent institution? I said, well, when people go to the University of Illinois, do you think that they go there for some particular reason? He said, yeah, probably they think when they graduate, they'll get a job. 
I said, and do they teach job skills at the University of Illinois? He says, no, for the most part they don't. Moreover, they couldn't because your average professor doesn't know any job skills except professoring, which isn't actually any, a job that they're preparing people for. Although when you learn, think about deeply about how universities work, you discover that's the only job they're preparing you for. That what universities do is train you to be researchers because that's what professors are. They're researchers. They know how to do that. The problem is that most kids do not go to college intending to be researchers. And if they did, they'd be, only be right if, in the United States, in any case, to go to about 20, 30, 40 universities because those are the only research universities we have. But we have 4,000 colleges. So there's an awful lot of folks who are going to colleges who are learning to be researchers from people who actually aren't researchers and are never going to be researchers. So let's summarize. What's learning about? Everyone knows what learning is about. There's nothing complicated about it. There's something you're trying to accomplish. It starts with a goal. There's something you want, and you want to do it. It doesn't matter what it is. It could be throwing a ball into a hoop. It could, it could be writing a, a letter that persuades somebody to do something. It could, it could be uh, cooking a good meal. It really doesn't matter what the goal is. But when you have a goal, you actually have to try it out and do some stuff. You may not know what to do, so you might have to ask somebody. You might have to find out something. You might have to read something. And whatever you do, it will help you try. And when you try and do something for the first time, you will fail. Nobody does anything right the first time. And so when you fail, you will have to possibly ask somebody for help. This is why I believe in mentors. I really strongly believe in teachers. Ask somebody, why did I fail? A good teacher may not tell you. They may ask you, well, why do you think you failed? Well, what could you do to find out? Um, I believe in Socratic teaching. In my company, Socratic Arts. I think the issue is not to be telling people things. And so now you failed. What happens? You try again. <laughs> and then you try again, and they try again, and it's eventually you get very good at something. And teaching is a one-on-one -on -one experience. If you want to learn to throw a ball into a hoop, You've got to try throwing it, and you've got to have somebody saying, hey, you pushed too hard here, or you didn't throw the ball that way, or you might look this way, you might look that way. It, it, it's, it's what we do in anything that's important in education. And if you think about, like, for example, how do doctors learn to be doctors? Well, they put up with endless amounts of silly courses in which they have to memorize the bones or a range of other uh, nonsense things that have nothing to do with what they'll ever do. And eventually they get themselves into an operating room and dealing with a patient. And there they were all playing the role of an apprentice. They're watching the, the, the guy who's really the surgeon, and then at some point maybe they make, get to make a cut under his supervision, or they get to try something under somebody's supervision. So we learn from experience, and experience turns out to be really best done under the supervision of somebody else. Well, why don't we do that in, in school? Because school is stupid. I don't know what else to say. School is stupid. It's been around in a way for so long that nobody questions it. We all went to school. We all spent all that time in school. And so we're pretty sure that school must be right in some way. We don't know what way it is right, but we know it must be right in some way. And so we don't really buy that maybe it's not got its head, on, head screwed on correctly. I mean, I, I always like to tell two stories about education. I don't want to tell stories that I can tell personal family stories. The first I'm going to tell the story about my son. My son, when he was, I was a professor at Yale, and my parents lived in New York, and so when we went to visit them, we off rode the subway in New York, and my son was just in love with the subway. He loved it, a, a tremendous passion. And when he was 10 years old, I decided that my children were being raised in a fancy suburb, and I was learning all the wrong values of what would the parents owned was important, what car you, what, what, what jacket you owned was important. So I, I said, oh, this is just stupid. And I pulled him out of school and moved to Paris for a year. I got a visiting professorship there. I figured they'd at least learn that the rest of the world was a little different than they were. And when I got to Paris, I, I took my son to the Paris Metro, and I said, here's how you buy a ticket. Here's how you read the map. Goodbye. And he said, why have you been keeping this from me? He was 10 years old. Why have you been keeping this from me? In other words, the freedom to travel around where he wanted, and he loved subways. He spent the entire year we lived in Paris on the subway system until he got to every, every line and every stop. And then he learned the, the bus system. Then he'd sit around and do fantasy cities. He would just draw maps of cities he made up, and the transportation system he'd make up for them. And I would take my kids traveling with me whenever I went on a trip to give a speech. So I remember once taking him when he was maybe 14 to Tokyo. He never got above ground in Tokyo. He saw nothing in Tokyo except the subway. That's all he cared to see. And so he went to college in New York at Columbia University and he called me up and he said, I've decided to be a history major. And I said, okay, come home. 
There's no income home. I said, I'm not paying for anyone to be a history major. What job would you get? That's not a real thing to be doing in terms of the real world. The only job they have is history teacher. You want to be a history teacher? A history professor? And there aren't very many of those jobs. I said, well, I'm not paying for it. He said, well, what should I major in? I said, subways. He said, well, how do you major in subways? Now, the fact of the matter is somebody should have been able to help him with that, with that question a long time before. And of course, Columbia University doesn't have a subway major, as you might imagine. But I thought, I'm not going to tell him what to do. I said, why don't you find out? Somewhere in that big university is someone who knows about subways. So he went and he called back, called me back. He said, I found a graduate seminar in transportation, but they wouldn't take me. I'm a freshman. I said, they'll take you. What I meant was if they said no to him, they'd hear from me. But they didn't say no to him. They said, okay. And he suddenly was in this transportation seminar and as a graduate student, I was a freshman where he didn't really belong. And to make a long story short, he discovered there was an urban planning major in Columbia that he was more interested in because that did cities. And then he went to MIT and got a master's in transportation, which there was actually a field there. Then he went back to Columbia, got a PhD in transportation. And you can look up, up on the web today. He is the CEO of a transportation policy think tank in Washington, D.C., doing what he loves. You know, doing it for me. I didn't care about subways. He cared about subways. What I want to know is why were we making him take calculus and why were we making him take English literature? Why, now, I know there are answers to this. Oh, the gigs were a well-rounded, broadly educated. Nonsense. It's nonsense. Okay? People aren't sitting around having conversations about Chaucer. In an era when people don't have to go to work, when Harvard and Yale were, were, were training grounds for the elite so they could become president of the United States, which Yale and Harvard were very good at, by the way, or, or, or governor, or, or head of the big corporation, or going to daddy's business, then we, we don't have to educate them anywhere way because they'd be educated at work, so they can read literature for a while. And that was the classic education that the church had decided in the Middle Ages anyway, and so that's fine, but it bears no relationship to what we're doing now. Second story is about, not about my son, but about my son-in-law. My son-in-law, when I met him, was not my son-in-law, but my boyfriend, uh, boyfriend and my daughter, and my daughter decided they wanted to live in New York, and, and she decided, he decided he wanted to do a Ph.D. also at Columbia. And I said, I happened to have a Columbia catalog with me, and I handed it to him, and I said, well, pick a field. And he picked Russian literature. And I said, you have to be kidding me. There are no jobs in Russian literature. Why are you going to do, why are you studying Russian literature? Well, I love it, because he'd gone to Amherst, where they taught him to love it. So his college education taught him to love something that was, in some sense, deeply impractical to love. It's okay if he wants to read Russian literature. That's very nice. Why, why would you pay $100,000 in tuition to read Russian literature on your own? Well, you could actually find somebody else like, or read it with him. But it didn't work like that. Well, of course, I was the father-in-law, not the father, and so where my son had to listen to me, he didn't. To make a long story short, he got a PhD in Russian literature. Yeah. <laughs> and then I get a plaintiff call from my daughter one day. It says, I don't think I can be married to a man who doesn't have a job. Because nobody was going to employ him for this. And why high schools and colleges don't feel bad about training people to do things that are unemployable, I don't know, but I do. And in any case, he's now a very good instructional designer for my company. But my, my point is this, that what you are what you're dealing with in the school system is something fraudulent. What you're dealing with is a school system which is operating under a set of premises for a different time and a different period in a situation where only the elite got educated and no one really had to work. And so what we could do is ignore the, ignore the, um, the, the, the needs of the people. And there's a dirty little secret about college, I like to say to people, which is that you understand that even to this day it is still exactly elitist in the same way. We don't really care about poor people and trying to get them to be not poor people. The, the education system is really about keeping people in the same class that they started out in. And so that's, you know, how the, the elite universities manage to function by keep getting the elite class to go to them. And the elite class pays the big tuition. And eventually these kids are not having job problems because they were part of the elite class in the first place and they find jobs. But you, you're, you're, you, it's to, to the idea that we must force everyone to go to college, which has been a mantra in this country for years now, um, we're forcing people to go into massive debt for no reason. And the only way to fix that is to get high school to be useful. But it just isn't. It just isn't. Memorizing algebra equations is not going to do you any good. And whereas there are always people who are sitting around saying, you need algebra. And I, when I say this, you know, 
will always tell me they need algebra. Oh, I use it OA every day. And when I say, okay, tell me what you use, what you did in algebra any time in the last week or the last year or the last 10 years, and no one ever has an answer for that. We, we have, a, it's like a religion. Algebra is very important, but no one can remember why. And, and, and literature is very important, but no one can remember why. And, and I'm in, I spent a lot of time in Spain, and in Spain, there's an endless love of literature. There, you know, everybody must read Don Quixote. Why? Well, because it's been the curriculum for a long time. Well, it's our Spanish culture. It turns out it's also the Mexican culture, kind of curiously. I don't understand why. <laughs> but Mexicans have to read Don Quixote, too. And the question is, why are they learning about Don Quixote? i tell you what they're not learning about in Spain. The Spanish Inquisition, they're not learning about that. They're not learning about what they did to Latin America. All you have to do is visit Latin America to see what they did. But they're not teaching them that. So what we have, and this is we were talking, I was talking earlier to, to Steve about the about the um, about John Dewey, and John Dewey is one of my heroes. And John Dewey wrote a book called Democracy and Education, in which he basically said um, that all we're trying to do in education is to make sure that the state remains in control, and the state teaches its little facts. So we see this in cultures that we aren't our own. So we know that Nazi Germany, they were educating everyone to be good Nazis and the, Stalin, the Stalinists were educating good people to be communists. But we don't see it in our own country. In our own country, we are educating people to not fight the system. So in this country, we educate everyone to believe that it's the best country in the whole world and we always do right things. Which is cute, but you know, there are a lot of countries in the world just fine. Uh, <laughs> it, it's not, I have no, no problem with the United States, I like it. <laughs> but I don't think the purpose of the education system is to tell everybody that this is the best country in the world, whatever country you're talking about. The purpose of the education system is presumably to create people who can think for themselves. And there's only one way to do that. Trying to think about something you care about, helping you in a goal that you're trying to accomplish with a teacher who will help you when you get into trouble. And I said earlier I was going to say something about majors, and there's a wonderful thing which I recommend everyone look at. Ohio State has written, uh, has done a video on relating majors and careers. They're trying to convince people that majors and careers are connected and how you choose a major. And they use as an example the English major, which I've been making fun of. And what they say, an English major could be, and it's, it's lovely, you can see it online, it's, it's YouTube, it's a nice video. Um, and then they say, an English major could be, for example, an entrepreneur. I'm not sure how that relates, but that's what they said. I mean, I guess you could. No one's stopping you from being an entrepreneur or an English major. Or an English major could be an English teacher. Well, that one's clear enough. Or it says an English major could be a script writer on, for a film. So I went and looked up to see if there were any script writing courses in the English department at Ohio State. <laughs> but there aren't. <laughs> so you have to start thinking that maybe everyone is kidding you. That this is, this is kind of fraudulent in some way. So I'm proposing high school change. And high school change is a very specific way. No classrooms, a building where people can go and be in a safe environment and have other kids to talk to. No paying attention to facts and truths. This is a John Dewey quote. The notion that some subjects and methods of an acquaintance with certain facts and truths possess educational value in and of themselves is the reason why traditional education reduced the material of education so largely to a diet of pre-digested materials. He wrote that in 1916. That all we have is a set of facts which we're supposed to memorize, and that's education, and he's complaining about it, and now it's 100 years later, and no one has done anything about it. Plato, a long time before that, said, according to my view, anyone who wants to be good at anything has to practice that thing from their youth upwards. If you want to be a builder, you should play at building children's houses. If you want to be a, 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 fire, a, a farmer, you have to till the ground. And the education means providing them with the tools to mimic the real life thing. That's just as true now as it was true then. And Immanuel Kant said, all our knowledge begins with experience. There can be no doubt. No knowledge of ours antecedent to experience, but begins with it. So how hard is this to rethink? Throw out what we have in high school, just say bye-bye to that, and then move on to how can we give kids experiences that they choose that are consonant with their goals, and the answer is that online makes that all possible. Because if you choose to be an aerospace engineer and there's nobody in your town who can teach you, there are people in Seattle who can teach you. And as all we have to do is convince the corporations, I think the right people to convince, to sponsor, like, for example, Boeing, to build 
sponsor the building of a long curriculum in aerospace engineering, which if anyone takes it, they prepare to mentor. It would be useful for Boeing if they did that because they'd be able to hire better people. They wouldn't have to you would probably even pay them so much because they wouldn't have to be have master's degrees and get their master's degrees right before they're out of high school. And my sense in the world is that is that the that high school has to start to be about a, a set of experiences you choose from, you try some on for a while, you you say you don't want to do any more do that one, you try something else, you try something new, it doesn't matter what it is, how many things you do until you find some passion that you want to follow. And it shouldn't be about algebra, and it shouldn't be about history, and it shouldn't be about literature, and it shouldn't be about all the crap it's about now. And that's the end of what I had to say. <laughs> I'm prepared to answer. There's questions. lots of comments. I've saved them. Um, but I'm going to start with something, Roger, which is, um, you know, John Taylor Gatto talks about the ways in which the existing school system benefits those who like being in control. So to what degree is this a story of power and control, meaning this ability to sort of throw things out, that would actually really sort of disrupt a lot of ways in which people depend on students being compliant and conforming. Well, that's one of the things we're teaching, after all. I mean, whenever I give a lecture and there's like a thousand people in the lecture room, and I think, I couldn't be sitting there listening to anybody. I, would, I couldn't listen to myself. I can't listen to anybody for an hour. How do people do that? Because they went through years and years of training on sitting still. If you think about it, when you go to the first grade, it's the first thing they're teaching you. Sit still. Don't call out, don't, don't, don't shout out at a turn. You have to behave, behave, behave. The number of things, one thing school is doing is teaching you to behave and follow the rules. And that's very much inter in the interest of the state, no matter what state you're talking about. So part of the problem is that, that it is about power and control. It's also about trying to funnel people into uh, the kind of places we want them to be. But if that may include funneling them into being garbage men. And by funneling them into being garbage and by having them fail at algebra and say, oh, I guess I can't do anything. Well, we can hire you as a garbage man. Oh, all right, because I'm stupid and I don't know algebra. I mean, so I think it's an insidious plot, actually. I'm not sure any, any one person thought it out. I actually know why algebra is taught in the United States, and it's a funnier reason than that, which is that there was the, the subcommittee in 1892 to choose the curriculum, the president of Harvard was running, the, the subcommittee chair of mathematics was the chairman of the mathematics department at Princeton. And he was selling an algebra textbook at the time. So often things are about money. <laughs> and a lot of what we're, we're selling in school and doing in school is not just about power and control. It's also about all the people who make money out of all this testing. You know, in Florida, where I stay, where I live, they, they spend $300 million a year on just on grading the tests. <laughs> Think about how big those industries are. Testing industry, the public, uh, the test printing industry, the, uh, the the test prep industry. These are some big, powerful money and interests who like things staying the way they are. Uh, we have two Maureens in the room. BCD Tech Maureen has asked several questions, and I'm wondering if she'd be comfortable taking the mic. Maureen, do you want to? I've given you a mic privilege. You can just click on the microphone, and that you had several questions, and I'm guessing that you might want to take the first shot here. No headset, she says. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna pick one. So Maureen wants to know. Um, <laughs> of the twelve things she's asked here, hang on. Um, okay. Uh, she wants to know what are the basics then? What is expected to be learned in elementary school that will form the foundation of this proposed new experience in high school? Well, I have two answers to that. The first is the standard answer. Reading, writing, and arithmetic are very basic. Okay? Then, well, actually, I have three answers. Then I have a second answer, which is that, is that it, it turns out can, uh, the reasoning is like, really important. Having people understand how to reason from evidence. And teamwork is very important. You can't, we don't live alone by ourselves. We have to learn how to work in, in groups. That's typically how things work. And uh, similar to that is human relations. You've got to get along with other people. So that's, that's the second level. Now, I have a third level. My most recent book is called Teaching Minds, and it lays out 12 cognitive processes that are everyday processes that people have to learn to be good at. For example, prediction. You've got to predict what's going to happen on the, in a given situation when you do things. And learning to be able to predict is very important. And that can be done at any age and any time. For example, in my normal lecture of this type, I, have a, I show a picture of me and my then six-year-old grandson, and we're at the racetrack, 
we're trying to predict who's going to win the next horse race. Now, he's reading the, the, the racing form and trying to understand how to make this prediction because he knows that if he wins, he'll win money because I'm giving him money to bet. But it's not about you know prediction for, for gambling necessarily. It's about prediction for anything you do. When you get married, you're making a prediction that it's going to work out. When you do say something to a child and uh, you're a child and trying to get them to behave, you're making a prediction that that's the right thing to say. And at work, when you hand in work, you're making a prediction that it'll be that it'll be good work and that it'll be accepted and the person will like it. So understanding how to make predictions, understand how to make evaluations, understanding how to make judgments. A big one is experimentation, and by that I do not mean what they do in science when they say experimentation. Every child knows how to do experimentation. You know, when you're one years old, you're experimenting with putting everything in your mouth to see how it works. Okay, and eventually, when you're two years old, you're experimenting with how many times you can say no and get away with it. And this level of experimentation continues through life, and it should continue in, in, a, in a controlled way in the sense that you, you understand, you've tried this, it didn't work, you understand why it didn't work, you tried this, it did work, you can explain it. So explaining the predictions and explaining the expectations are important. Planning. Planning has got to be one of the most important things we do, and you don't teach it anywhere. But it's one of those things that should be taught all through elementary school. How to create a plan for anything, a plan to get fed, a plan to, get to, to, run, for, to run for office, a plan to build something. So there are, I, I've written these all down, and you can find them on my website, you don't have to go buy my book. But the issue is that, that all those different kinds of, um, of, of, of things are the basics. There are basics. Those basics, if they're not learned by the time you're entering high school, you've got a problem. Because whereas you can get better at them for sure, it's very important that you actually be able to think clearly and make a reasoned argument and express yourself long before you get into the situation of trying to choose what you're going to do. So, Rogers, Roger, countries that have kind of come together around an education plan, like Finland or Singapore, have often done so based on economic arguments. How do you, how do you envision a culture that has sort of depended on this kind of schooling system to come to some level, enough agreement, to actually start making this kind of a change? Well, I think it's hard to do. I, I remember having a funny experience in Singapore. I gave a speech to the Singapore Teachers Association, which was roundly hated, as you might imagine. But it was on television. And when I walked out the door, uh, the people in the street were shaking my hand. Because I, would, I, had, a, I had appealed to the, the, re, the regular public, not to the teachers. And Singapore had an idea that, after the British system, that their graduates should go on to Oxford and Cambridge and get A-levels and O-levels. And it's exactly what you shouldn't be doing. I, 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 a way of putting it is this. Um, I, had a, I have a friend who kind of knows everybody. <laughs> and it's kind of astonishing, but he does. And, and one day he went, met Fidel Castro, which is rather astonishing for an American, but he did. And he came back and he said, I talked all about you to Fidel Castro, and he wants to know, would you like to be education minister of Cuba? <laughs> which I thought was a funny question. And I said, okay, sure. And he, my friend asked me, what would you do? I said, I don't know, because I don't know what Cuba wants to be. It can't be everything. It can only be something. So you, you can't be the leader in everything in the world. So when you think about what you're going to try and do in your education system, you should have some model of what your country is going to be and what it's good at, what its natural resources are. Uh, and here's an example, a way of putting this. When I was in, I was in, in New Mexico, which is for the foreigners, one of the states in the United States in the, in, that is still occupied by the original Native Americans. And the reason why you need to know that is it, it, it will come obvious in a minute. So I was getting the New Mexico legislature to back me. In the end, the governor decided that I was a bad guy. But the legislature had wanted to back my virtual high school. And so as part of my research, I went and I talked to various folks. So I talked to the Native Americans. And I asked them, well, what would you like in school for your kids? And I realized they didn't want their kids to go off to MIT and become engineers and then never come back to live in New Mexico. They wanted their, their tribes to stay together. So I said, well, so what is it that would be right for you for high school? And they said something to me, and I, when I heard it, I thought I started to laugh because it was so obviously right. They said, we have only two things we really care about. The first is casino management. And if you're not an American, you might not understand why. But because casinos are legal on, a, on Native American property. And so they are in the casino business. So they really want to, they, their kids to learn how to manage casinos. See, that's rational. That's an opportunity in that environment. And the second thing, because it's a desert in New Mexico, is they were very interested in land use and land management. And that makes lots of sense. And right this minute, I'm in New York City, where neither of those things make any sense as anything to be teaching in the school system. So part of the issue you have to think about is you have to think about what your country 
want. And not, not some bland notion of education, but what's realistic within the, uh, within the economy that you have and the physical environment that you have. But, uh, but even so, I mean, I understand Finland is very advanced, and it's not that advanced. They're still teaching algebra. As long as you're teaching algebra, you're not advanced. Okay, so we're going we're gonna to skip back just a second because there were two questions that relate to each other that I think we kind of passed over the moment for but are important. Peggy wanted to know what makes it important for your vision to happen at high school age, and Monica wanted to know why even wait till high school? Well, why even wait to high school is a wonderful question. So no reason to. In fact, you could look up on one of my websites, and I've got a, a, a six, a, an engineering curriculum for six-year-olds, which is meant to be one of a thousand. <laughs> I'd love to start doing this in first grade. I'd love to. I, I, and the problem is that, you know, you, you have to pick your spots. And at this moment, high school, I think, is looking so stupid that people are starting to understand it. But uh, I have no problem with starting earlier, no question about it. Now, uh, what was the first part of the question? Was oh, well, related? I think it was, there, was, there were related questions, which was why is it important in high school? And I think what you're saying is it's the, it's the nature of what we see rather than necessarily the uh, stage at which the, the youth are. No, there's another reason why it's important. It's important in high school because it turns out that's where we lose the kids. Is that when you have a kid in the second grade or the third grade, they they they, they still kind of like going to school. They may not love it, but they they get to play with the other kids and they and, and, and they're kind of involved. I, I mean, I have uh, my grandson, the oldest grandson, is third grade, and I said, "What did you learn?" He says, "You know, we're learning about Brazil." And I said, "Why?" He said, "I have no idea why." He said, "What are you learning?" I said, "He says, I don't know. We're learning out from didn't remember. I don't care." But he still doesn't like. He doesn't just like going to school. He got, because it's fun. He plays with kids. He's having a good time. But by the time kids get to high school, they typically have lost. We've lost them. We've lost their interest. And so I'm just arbitrarily picking high school as the thing that can be changed. But I no problem with starting earlier. None at all. Okay, and for those of you who have left questions, I am not going in order, but I will come back. Um, Kevin wanted to know, is there a system of education anywhere that even approaches what you're proposing? You know, Germany is, is not bad in the sense that it, try, it tends to do vocational education early on. It, 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 we used to have vocational education in this, in this uh, country. In fact, in New York City, there was a school called Aviation High School, which is right next to John F. Kennedy Airport. And you could choose to go to Aviation High School and then get employed at Kennedy Airport. That, that went away because what they learned was the only people who chose it were non-white. They, they, were, they, were, they were quite typically, you know, foreigners who were looking for jobs and still had the idea that a job would be a good thing. And it became, this became very un, uh, unpolitically correct to have a school that was all occupied by non-whites. So they kind of started closing the, these things down. So the idea that, that we had uh, that practical education or vocational education, vocational education is, is a, a bad word in the United States. And it's not a bad word in Germany. So uh, whereas Germany was the people who started all this, believe me, the, the American education system is copied off the German system. So I'm not praising them, and their, and their university system is, is, is still as crazy or crazier than the U.S. system. But you can move into more vocational education. The problem is still that the word vocational education is seen as pejorative. There's something wrong with you if you're in vocational education. Instead of saying the opposite, which is insisting that kids come out of school with a vocation, or two, or five, who cares? But they should be able to do something that someone could hire them to do besides sweep the streets, and deliver pizzas. Okay. Um, Alka is coming in from India, and she wonders if you've had any experiences with um, the Indian education system. Well, I have a lot more experiences with the Pakistani education system, which may not help. <laughs> they really are different places. But um, the, the, I had as a, the largest school system in Pakistan called Beacon House School System is really enormous. And I am on their board of advisors, and I've been giving them advice all along. But the problem with that, you see, when you, and every time I do this, I've done this in lots of countries, not India. But I've done this in lots of countries. And the problem with this is that everyone still has the same idea that we really want everyone to go to Oxford. Because there's always, as soon as you get involved with the parents, and the parents are the big problem in changing education. They're the, probably the number one problem. Because parents have the idea that school, yeah, that's a nice change for other people, but I want my kid to go to Harvard. I want my kid to go to Oxford. Just today I got a phone call from somebody who I didn't even know. He said, well, he met me once, and I said, oh, all right, I'll talk to you. But an hour about it, his daughter didn't get into Harvard and, and how upset he was about it. 
And it wasn't clear how whether she was as upset as he was. And I, I think we have this idea that social mobility and, uh, and education are all the same thing, and they're all related for sure, and that, you know, in India, it, it going getting into the best universities, in the best IIT or even still Oxford and Cambridge, uh, is still seen as the, uh, as the ultimate. And so as long as, the, as that's seen as the ultimate, it's hard to change the system. Because I'm worried about the, you know, the, I'm worried about smart people, but I'm also worried about the average person who actually wants to do better, and nobody's letting him do better. Anyway, my experience in that part of the world is Pakistan, where I've been, I'm not sure I'm going back anytime soon, but I've been there quite a few times. Okay, so there were a number of questions that, um, uh, that kind of revolved around, aren't there things that are important to know to be a member of a democratic society or to be able to think scientifically or to make a quality of life or to help you be well-rounded? There's a feeling within the chat that a lot of this is focused on work, how do those other pieces fit in? Are they a part of what we should be doing? Well, yeah, let, me, let me give you my favorite example of that. It was not work, okay? Child raising. Why aren't there any courses in child raising in school? Why don't, why don't we learn about how to have rela human relationships, members of the opposite sex, same sex, whatever you like, how to have an actual marriage and relationship? Why isn't that part of school? Those are, that's not work. But that, you don't see that you don't see that anywhere. I once was working with Columbia University and tried to get them to ch change the development of psychology course into a course on how to raise a child, because it seemed to me that was important, and the theories of development of psychology weren't. But academics don't allow it. So there's a, there's a whole range of things that not about work that I think are extremely important. No question about it. But the the the, the things that we we tend to emphasize are all with this word academic. And, and I'm, what I'm trying to say, and I'm, trying, I'm making this point very radically, deliberately, suppose you threw out everything that was academic. Okay, now what's important to know? Nothing. If you're, in fact, in our democratic society, if you discover in the United States, any of you the average person on the street, in my normal speeches I have many interviews with the average person on the street, they already don't know anything. Okay, so you might want them to know something, but they don't. And the politicians appeal to their lack of knowledge by making things up about the world that they don't even understand what, what they could possibly be talking about. Um, I remember when, when the second President Bush got elected, something happened about Greek, and he, the Greeks, and he referred to them as the Grecians because he was so unfamiliar with Europe that he didn't even understand the word was Greeks. Okay? He gets to be president. So it's important that he know where Greece is? Well, yeah, if you can be president, but it's not important for everybody else. And, and, I, and having them memorize it didn't seem to work for George Bush, even though he went to Yale. So the issue is, it's all very well good to say everybody should know and then list about a billion things they should know. But it turns out all we really are doing is making them memorize them temporarily, spit them back on a multiple choice test, and then immediately forget them. And there are, there are there's something you can look on online, which is there's a, there's psychology, uh, every, there's advanced placement exams in the United States for getting you into college. And so there's a psychology advanced placement exam. Um, and I took it uh, as a professor of psychology and couldn't pass it. And I took it online. So I, sh I show my answers and why I don't know the answers to anything. And so it's the, the problem is not so much whether it's important for, something, for somebody to know something. The problem is the way we measure that in our society is through a whole lot of testing that is about temporary memorization. And so, of course, it's a good idea to know in the, if you're in the United States that the capital is in Washington and the president has certain powers and so on. But I'm not going to get too far before I get people, no one knows any of it. They know, they know the barest minimum about it. And that doesn't stop us from having them memorize it for a while, but then they forget it. So temporary memorization of facts that you think are important isn't an education system. It's, a, it's an assessment system. And facts just don't turn out to matter that much. So I think this is going to be like tossing you a softball or a stick of dynamite. <laughs> the question was, don't we need to instill a love of learning? Uh, you don't have to instill it. You have to kill it. Uh, there's no such thing as a child that doesn't have a love of learning. There, you've never met a child who, when, who said, you know, walking isn't that interesting. I don't think I'll learn to walk. Who, who said, ah, you know, the talking thing, I'm not going to do it because it's not worth it. Turns out it's hard to learn to walk and talk. And every child has a love of learning how to do that. And every child has a, a love of learning how to persuade his parent to give him good food and, and to not eat things he doesn't want and to go try new things. The love of learning is in every child, period, of end, of end of conversation until they go to school. School is not the place to instill it. School is the place to go out and deliberately kill it, to make sure that the child wants to learn something, but we're not going to make them learn something else. 
I've never seen a, a human being, a, adult or child, who wanted to learn something, who couldn't, and uh, really wanted to learn it, who couldn't figure out some way and some path to get to know it and, and get to learn it, and read about it, practice it, get somebody to teach them. That's not our problem. Everybody is born with a love of learning. And if you don't think that, that this is true of, of humans, try uh, some other higher level mammals. You know, you move the dog's food dish, he's going to learn where you put it. Uh, and you watch, you watch uh, apes that, that teach their children one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, this sense that, 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 that the parent-child relationship is inherently a teacher relationship and that the child is inherently a learner all the time is right there built into our species. It's been there forever. You have, what we do in school is kill it off. You don't have to instill anything. So Kevin asks, if school is the way it is due to economics, then how do we change the economics to change education? Well, actually, I think the economics of school uh, have changed already, and people haven't realized it. I think that when you had to have, and when, you know, my example is always Kansas. Okay, Kansas in the middle of those non-Americans, a state in the middle of nowhere in the United States. And in 18, 1850, there was one person in the, in, in the town who was, could read and write, and they were called a teacher. Okay, and so it, it wasn't so much about economics, it's about the fact that it was hard to get anyone around who could actually teach somebody. And when we, in big city schools, you know, you do have to serve a certain amount of money to make them go, but the cities can usually afford that. The real issue isn't that. The economics of the university is a big deal. That's why they pack a thousand people into a classroom. And that has a lot more to do with the fact that, that professors are very highly paid. These campuses are very expensive. There's all kinds of other facilities and, you know, gymnasiums and athletic teams. And there's a lot that the tuition is going into support. What's changed is the internet. That's what's changed. The Internet has allowed a possibility that your teacher could be somewhere else, so that you can learn anything independent of whether your teacher is in your building. And if your teacher, if, you only, if your school only could have, afford 35 teachers and they had to represent 10 subjects, then good luck with the 50th subject or the 100th, 100th subject. It wasn't going to happen. But now it can. Now, no matter what you want to learn, there's someone out there who would be willing to teach it to you. And they, for the most part, even don't have to be paid that much. I've, I live in Florida most of the time, which is a place where retired people live. And I'm telling you, these people are bored out of their minds and would teach for free. And a lot of them know a lot of stuff. They've run big companies. They, 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 they've been engineers. They, 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 they've been, uh, they've been, uh, they worked in finance. They've done a lot of things they've done. That, and they're really not anything to do with themselves. They'd be more than happy to be, to be available to mentor students when they need it in a project that they had helped design. The real issue here financially is it takes a lot of money to design the experience. You want to do the moral equivalent of the air flight simulator. You want to build whatever you want to be. If you would like to be a, a financier, then we have to start you at handling little amounts of money and eventually learning how to run, run a bank or however you want to say it. And that requires a, a fair amount of effort to building some very complicated simulations. It's not that much money, but it, it does cost money to do that. But the running of that would cost less than running a school because you don't really have to invest very much anymore in anything else other than that first investment once you've made it. Then from that point on, it's the same as paying teachers to, to be there, just the same, to be there and to be guidance, guide, guides and helpful and make sure everything works. And you, you don't necessarily need to, you don't need to be buying textbooks anymore and you don't need to be um, paying for uh, a, a, extra activities and so on and so forth. And the mentors probably don't cost that much from you. We use graduate students who tend, tend not to cost that much. So it's not the expense. And the Internet has changed the, 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 the availability of wherever you are, wherever your lady is in India and she would like to learn how to design a subway system, let's make this up, okay, somewhere in the world there's someone who will help you learn, learn that. And it may not be where you, where you are. I mean, let's, I'm trying to pick up something very non-Indian. There may be an Indian subway system. I was only in India once a long time ago. But you know, I mean, and try, you pick something that doesn't exist and say, well, I want to learn that. Okay, well, I want to be a French chef. Well, someone, somewhere, will be willing to teach you to be a French chef. And, and, and all I'm saying is that I think that's all possible and, and, and is not wildly expensive. It requires an initial investment. And I think that big corporations or, 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 or wealthy individuals need to put up the money for each one of these curricula. I mean, I've been thinking, you know, about how, how we need to build an engineering curriculum, and why isn't G building that curriculum? Why don't they, have, they would be able to hire engineers and spend less money on training? It's even in their interest. 
Uh, and when I talk about animation, well, why isn't Disney designing it and helping design the animation curriculum? I mean, there's a whole range of, of very of people, big corporations with plenty of money, who could be designing these curricula and make them available worldwide for nothing. <laughs> Roger, that was terrific. It was just <laughs> perfect. You can't see I'm clapping for you Good. here. <laughs> Hang on one second. I think our next keynote is calling me, and I need to pause there. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and turn the recording off. We're going to give a big thanks to Roger Shank. Uh, really, Roger, delightful. So so glad that you were able to take the time. Okay, well, it, it was fun. It was fun. Thanks, thanks everybody. Fun. Great, great fun. Yes, I'll, I'll send okay. you a note. Bye -bye. Okay, take care. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye.